section twenty eight of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty four part two gradually as months passed away the floods grew still the mighty rushes of the inner tide ceased to dash there came first a delicious calmness and then a celestial inner clearness in which the soul seemed to lie quiet as an untroubled ocean reflecting heaven then came the fulness of mysterious communion given to the pure in heart that advent of the comforter in the soul teaching all things and bringing all things to remembrance and mary moved in a world transfigured by a celestial radiance her face so long mournfully calm like some chiselled statue of patience now wore a radiance as when one places a light behind some alabaster screen sculptured with mysterious and holy emblems and words of strange sweetness broke from her as if one should hear snatches of music from a door suddenly opened in heaven something wise and strong and sacred gave an involuntary impression of awe in her looks and words it was not the childlike loveliness of early days looking with dove-like ignorant eyes on sin and sorrow but the victorious sweetness of that great multitude who have come out of great tribulation having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb in her eyes there was that nameless depth that one sees with awe in the sistine madonna eyes that have measured infinite sorrow and looked through it to an infinite peace my dear madam said the doctor to mrs scudder i cannot but think there must be some uncommonly gracious exercises passing in the mind of your daughter for i observe that though she is not inclined to conversation she seems to be much in prayer and i have of late felt the sense of a divine presence with her in a most unusual degree has she opened her mind to you mary was always a silent girl said mrs scudder and not given to speaking of her own feelings indeed until she gave you an account of her spiritual state on joining the church i never knew what her exercises were hers is a most singular case i never knew the time when she did not seem to love god more than anything else it has disturbed me sometimes because i did not know but it might be mere natural sensibility instead of gracious affection do not disturb yourself madam said the doctor the spirit worketh when where and how he will and undoubtedly there have been cases where his operations commence exceedingly early mr edwards relates a case of a young person who experienced a marked conversion when three years of age and jeremiah was called from the womb jeremiah one five in all cases we must test the quality of the evidence without relation to the time of its commencement i do not generally lay much stress on our impressions which are often uncertain and delusive yet i have had an impression that the lord would be pleased to make some singular manifestations of his grace through this young person in the economy of grace there is neither male nor female and peter says acts two seventeen that the spirit of the lord shall be poured out and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy yet if we consider that the son of god as to his human nature was made of a woman it leads us to see that in matters of grace god sets a special value on woman's nature and designs to put special honour upon it accordingly there have been in the church in all ages holy women who have received the spirit and been called to a ministration in the things of god such as deborah huldah and anna the prophetess in our own days most uncommon manifestations of divine grace have been given to holy women it was my privilege to be in the family of president edwards at a time when northampton was specially visited and his wife seemed and spoke more like a glorified spirit than a mortal woman and multitudes flocked to the house to hear her wonderful words she seemed to have such a sense of the divine love as was almost beyond the powers of nature to endure just to speak the words our father who art in heaven would overcome her with such a manifestation that she would become cold and almost faint 
and though she uttered much yet she told us that the divinest things she saw could not be spoken these things could not be fanaticism for she was a person of a singular evenness of nature and of great skill and discretion in temporal matters and of an exceeding humility sweetness and quietness of disposition i have observed of late said mrs scudder that in our praying circles mary seemed much carried out of herself and often as if she would speak and with difficulty holding herself back i have not urged her because i thought it best to wait till she should feel full liberty therein you do rightly madam said the doctor but i am persuaded you will hear from her yet it came at length the hour of utterance and one day in a praying circle of the women of the church all were startled by the clear silver tones of one who sat among them and spoke with the unconscious simplicity of an angel child calling god her father and speaking of an ineffable union in christ binding all things together in one and making all complete in him she spoke of a love passing knowledge passing all love of lovers or of mothers a love for ever spending yet never spent a love ever pierced and bleeding yet ever constant and triumphant rejoicing with infinite joy to bear in its own body the sins and sorrows of a universe conquering victorious love rejoicing to endure panting to give and offering its whole self with an infinite joyfulness for our salvation and when kneeling she poured out her soul in prayer her words seemed so many winged angels musical with unearthly harpings of an untold blessedness they who heard her had the sensation of rising in the air of feeling a celestial light and warmth descending into their souls and when rising she stood silent and with downcast drooping eyelids there were tears in all eyes and a hush in all movements as she passed as if something celestial were passing out miss prissy came rushing homeward to hold a private congratulatory talk with the doctor and mrs scudder while mary was tranquilly setting the tea-table and cutting bread for supper to see her now certainly said miss prissy moving round so thoughtful not forgetting anything and doing everything so calm you wouldn't a thought it could be her that spoke those blessed words and made that prayer well certainly that prayer seemed to take us all right up and put us down in heaven and when i opened my eyes and saw the roses and asparagus bushes on the mantle-tree piece i had to ask myself where have i been oh miss scudder her afflictions have been sanctified to her and really when i see her going on so i feel she can't be long for us they say dying grace is for dying hours and i'm sure this seems more like dying grace than anything that i ever yet saw she is a precious gift said the doctor let us thank the lord for his grace through her she has evidently had a manifestation of the beloved and feedeth among the lilies and we will not question the lord's further dispensations concerning her certainly said miss prissy briskly it's never best to borrow trouble sufficient unto the day is enough to be sure and now miss scudder i thought i'd just take a look at that dove-coloured silk of yours to-night to see what would have to be done with it because i must make every minute tell and you know i lose half a day every week for the prayer meeting though i ought not to say i lose it either for i was telling miss general wilcox i wouldn't give up that meeting for bags and bags of gold she wanted me to come and sew for her one wednesday and says i miss wilcox i'm poor and have to live by my work but i ain't so poor but what i have some comforts and i can't give up my prayer meeting for any money for you see if one gets a little lift there it makes all the work go lighter but then i have to be particular to save up every scrap and end of time mrs scudder and miss prissy crossed the kitchen and entered the bedroom and soon had the dove-coloured silk under consideration well miss scudder said miss prissy after mature investigation here's a broad hem not cut at all on the edge as i see and that might be turned down and so cut off the worn spot up by the waist and then if it is turned it will look every bit and grain as well as a new silk i'll sit right down now and go to ripping i put my ripping knife into my pocket when i put on this dress to go to prayer-meeting because says i to myself there'll be something to do at miss scudder's to-night 
you just get an iron to the fire and we'll have it all ripped and pressed out before dark miss prissy seated herself at the open window as cheery as a fresh apple blossom and began busily plying her knife looking at the garment she was ripping with an astute air as if she were about to circumvent it into being a new dress by some surprising act of leger de main mrs scudder walked to the looking-glass and began changing her bonnet cap for a tea-table one miss prissy after a while commenced in a mysterious tone miss scudder i know folks like me shouldn't have their eyes open too wide but then i can't help noticing some things did you see the doctor's face when we was talking to him about mary why he coloured all up and the tears came into his eyes it's my belief that that blessed man worships the ground she treads on i don't mean worships either cause that would be wicked and he's too good a man to make a graven image of anything but it's clear to see that there ain't anybody in the world like mary to him i always did think so but i used to think mary was such a little poppet that she'd do better for well you know i thought about some younger man but laws now i see how she rises up to be ahead of everybody and is so kind of solemn like i can't but see the leadings of providence what a minister's wife she'd be miss scudder why all the ladies coming out of prayer meeting were speaking of it you see they want the doctor to get married it seems more comfortable like to have ministers married one feels more free to open their exercises of mind and as miss deacon twitchell said to me if the lord had made a woman a purpose as he did for adam he wouldn't have made her a bit different from mary scudder why the oldest of us would follow her lead cause she goes before us without knowing it i feel that the lord has greatly blessed me in such a child said mrs scudder and i feel disposed to wait the leadings of providence just exactly said miss prissy giving a shake to her silk and as miss twitchell said in this case every providence seems to pint i felt dreadfully for her along six months back but now i see how she's been brought out i begin to see that things are for the best perhaps after all i can't help feeling that jim marvin is gone to heaven poor fellow his father is a deacon and such a good man and jim though he did make a great laugh wherever he went and sometimes laughed where he hadn't ought to was a noble-hearted fellow now to be sure as the doctor says amiable instincts ain't true holiness but then they are better than unamiable ones like simeon brown's i do think if that man is a christian he is a dreadful ugly one he snapped me short up about my change when he settled with me last tuesday and if i hadn't felt that it was a sinful rise and i should have told him i'd never put foot in his house again i'm glad for my part he's gone out of our church now jim marvin was like a prince to poor people and i remember once his mother told him to settle with me and he gave me most double and wouldn't let me make change confound it all miss prissy says he i wouldn't stitch as you do from morning to night for double that money now i know we can't do anything to recommend ourselves to the lord but then i can't help feeling some sorts of folks must be by nature more pleasing to him than others david was a man after god's own heart and he was a generous whole soul fellow like jim marvin though he did get carried away by his spirit sometimes and do wrong things and so i hope the lord saw fit to make jim one of the elect we don't ever know what god's grace has done for folks i think a great many are converted when we know nothing about it as miss twitchell told poor old miss tyrell who was mourning about her son a dreadful wild boy who was killed falling from masthead she says that from the masthead to the deck was time enough for divine grace to do the work i have always had a trembling hope for poor james said mrs scudder not on account of any of his good deeds or amiable traits because election is without foresight of any good works but i felt he was a child of the covenant at least by the father's side and i hope the lord has heard his prayer these are dark providences the world is full of them and all we can do is to have faith that the lord will bring infinite good out of finite evil and make everything better than if the evil had not happened that's what our good doctor is always repeating and we must try to rejoice in view of the happiness of the universe without considering whether we or our friends are to be included in it or not well dear me said miss prissy i hope if that is necessary it will please the lord to give it to me for i don't seem to find any power in me to get up to it but all's for the best at any rate and that's a comfort just at this moment mary's clear voice at the door announced that tea was on the table 
coming this very minute said miss prissy bustling up and pulling off her spectacles then running across the room she shut the door mysteriously and turned to mrs scudder with the air of an impending secret miss prissy was subject to sudden impulses of confidence in which she was so very cautious that not the thickest oak plank door seemed secure enough and her voice dropped to its lowest key the most important and critical words were entirely omitted or supplied by a knowing wink and a slight stamp of the foot in this mood she now approached mrs scudder and holding up her hand on the door side to prevent consequences if after all she should be betrayed into a loud word she said i thought i'd just say miss scudder that in case mary should the doctor in case you know there should be a in the house you must just contrive it so as to give me a month's notice so that i could give you a whole fortnight to fix her up as such a good man's ought to be now i know how spiritually minded our blessed doctor is but bless you ma'am he's got eyes i tell you miss scudder these men the best of em feel what's what though they don't know much i saw the doctor look at mary that night i dressed her for the wedding party i tell you he'd like to have his wife look pretty well and he'll get up some blessed text or other about it just as he did that night about being brought unto the king in raiment of needlework that is an encouraging thought to us sewing women but this thing was spoken of after the meeting miss twitchell and miss jones were talking about it and they all say that there would be the best setting out got for her that was ever seen in newport if it should happen why there's reason in it she ought to have at least two real good india silks that will stand alone and you'll see she'll have em too you let me alone for that and i was thinking as i lay awake last night of a new way of making up that you will say is just the sweetest that ever you did see and miss jones was saying that she hoped there wouldn't anything happen without her knowing it because her husband's sister in philadelphia has sent her a new receipt for cake and she has tried it and it came out beautifully and she says she'll send some in all the time that this stream was flowing mrs scudder stood with the properly reserved air of a discreet matron who leaves all such matters to providence and is not supposed unduly to anticipate the future and in reply she warmly pressed miss prissy's hand and remarked that no one could tell what a day might bring forth and other general observations on the uncertainty of mortal prospects which form a becoming shield when people do not wish to say more exactly what they are thinking of End of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty five part one nothing is more striking in the light and shadow of the human drama than to compare the inner life and thoughts of an elevated and silent nature with the thoughts and plans which those by whom they are surrounded have of and for them little thought mary of any of the speculations that busied the friendly head of miss prissy or that lay in the provident forecastings of her prudent mother when a life into which all our life nerves have run is cut suddenly away there follows after the first long bleeding is healed an internal paralysis of certain portions of our nature it was so with mary the thousand fibres that bind youth and womanhood to earthly love and life were all in her still as the grave and only the spiritual and divine part of her being was active her hopes desires and aspirations were all such as she could have had in greater perfection as a disembodied spirit than as a mortal woman the small stake for self which she had invested in life was gone and henceforward all personal matters were to her so indifferent that she scarce was conscious of a wish in relation to her own individual happiness she was through the sudden crush of a great affliction in that state of self-abnegation to which the mystics brought themselves by fastings and self-imposed penances 
a state not purely healthy nor realizing the divine ideal of a perfect human being made to exist in the relations of human life but one of those exceptional conditions which like the hours that often precede dissolution seem to impart to the subject of them a peculiar attitude for delicate and refined spiritual impressions we could not afford to have it always night and we must think that broad gay morning light when meadowlark and robin and bobolink are singing in chorus with a thousand insects and the waving of a thousand breezes is on the whole the most in accordance with the average wants of those who have a material life to live and material work to do but then we reverence that clear obscure of midnight when everything is still and dewy then sing the nightingales which cannot be heard by day then shine the mysterious stars so when all earthly voices are hushed in the soul all earthly lights darkened music and colour float in from a higher sphere no veiled nun with her shrouded forehead and downcast eyes ever moved about a convent with a spirit more utterly divided from the world than mary moved about her daily employments her care about the details of life seemed more than ever minute she was always anticipating her mother in every direction and striving by a thousand gentle preveniences to spare her from fatigue and care there was even a tenderness about her ministrations as if the daughter had changed feelings and places with the mother the doctor too felt a change in her manner towards him which always considerate and kind was now invested with a tender thoughtfulness and anxious solicitude to serve which often brought tears to his eyes all the neighbours who had been in the habit of visiting at the house received from her almost daily in one little form or another some proof of her thoughtful remembrance she seemed in particular to attach herself to mrs marvyn throwing her cares around that fragile and wounded nature as a generous vine will sometimes embrace with tender leaves and flowers a dying tree but her heart seemed to have yearnings beyond even the circle of home and friends she longed for the sorrowful and the afflicted she would go down to the forgotten and the oppressed and made herself the companion of the doctor's secret walks and explorings among the poor victims of the slave ships and entered with zeal as teacher among his african catechumens nothing but the limits of bodily strength could check her zeal to do and suffer for others a river of love had suddenly been checked in her heart and it needed all these channels to drain off the waters that otherwise must have drowned her in the suffocating agonies of repression sometimes indeed there would be a returning thrill of the old wound one of those overpowering moments when some turn in life brings back anew a great anguish she would find unexpectedly in a book a mark that he had placed there or a turn in conversation would bring back a tone of his voice or she would see on some thoughtless young head curls just like those which were swaying to and fro down among the wavering seaweeds and then her heart gave one great throb of pain and turn for relief to some immediate act of love to some living being they who saw her in one of these moments felt a surging of her heart towards them a moisture of the eye a sense of some inexpressible yearning and knew not from what pain that love was wrung and what poor heart was seeking to still its own throbbings in blessing them by what name shall we call this beautiful twilight this night of the soul so starry with heavenly mysteries not happiness but blessedness they who have it walk among men as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things 
the doctor as we have seen had always that reverential spirit towards women which accompanies a healthy and great nature but in the constant converse which he now held with a beautiful being from whom every particle of selfish feeling or mortal weakness seemed sublimed he appeared to yield his soul up to her leading with a wondering humility as to some fair miraculous messenger of heaven all questions of internal experience all delicate shadings of the spiritual history with which his pastoral communings in his flock made him conversant he brought to her to be resolved with the purest simplicity of trust she is one of the lord's rarities he said one day to mrs scudder and i find it difficult to maintain the bonds of christian faithfulness in talking with her it is a charm of the lord's hidden ones that they know not their own beauty and god forbid that i should tempt a creature made so perfect by divine grace to self-exaltation or lay my hand unadvisedly as uzzah did upon the ark of god by my inconsiderate praises well doctor said miss prissy who sat in the corner sewing on the dove-coloured silk i do wish you could come into one of our meetings and hear those blessed prayers i don't think you nor anybody else ever heard anything like em i would indeed that i might with propriety enjoy the privilege said the doctor well i'll tell you what said miss prissy next week they're going to meet here and i'll leave the door just ajar and you can hear every word just by standing in the entry thank you madam said the doctor it would certainly be a blessed privilege but i cannot persuade myself that such an act would be consistent with christian propriety ah now do hear that good man said miss prissy after he had left the room if he hain't got the making of a real gentleman in him as well as a real christian though i always did say for my part that a real christian will be a gentleman but i don't believe all the temptations in the world could stir that blessed man one jot or grain to do the least thing that he thinks is wrong or out of the way well i must say i never saw such a good man he is the only man i ever saw good enough for our mary another spring came round and brought its roses and the apple trees blossomed for the third time since the commencement of our story and the robins had repaired the old nest and began to lay their blue eggs in it and mary still walked her calm course as a sanctified priestess of the great worship of sorrow many were the hearts now dependent on her the spiritual histories the thread of which were held in her loving hand many the souls burdened with sins or oppressed with sorrow who found in her bosom at once confessional and sanctuary so many sought her prayers that her hours of intercession were full and needed to be lengthened often to embrace all for whom she would plead united to the good doctor by a constant friendship and fellowship she had gradually grown accustomed to the more and more intimate manner in which he regarded her which had risen from a simple dear child and dear mary to dear friend and at last dearest of all friends which he frequently called her and encouraged by the calm confiding sweetness of those still blue eyes and that gentle smile which came without one varying flutter of the pulse or the rising of the slightest flush on the marble cheek one day a letter was brought in postmarked philadelphia it was from madame de frontignac it was in french and ran as follows my dear little white rose i am longing to see you once more and before long i shall be in newport dear little mary i am sad very sad the days seem all of them too long and every morning i look out of my window and wonder why i was born i am not so happy as i used to be when i cared for nothing but to sing and smooth my feathers like the birds that is the best kind of life for us women if we love anything better than our clothes it is sure to bring us great sorrow for all that i can't help thinking it is very noble and beautiful to love love is very beautiful but very very sad my poor dear little white cat 
i should like to hold you a little while to my heart it is so cold all the time and aches so i wish i were dead but then i am not good enough to die the abbe says we must offer up our sorrow to god as a satisfaction for our sins i have a good deal to offer because my nature is strong and i can feel a great deal but i am very selfish dear little mary to think only of myself when i know how you must suffer ah but you knew he loved you truly the poor dear boy that is something i pray daily for his soul don't think it wrong of me you know it is our religion we should all do our best for each other remember me tenderly to mrs marvyn poor mother the bleeding heart of the mother of god alone can understand such sorrows i am coming in a week or two and then i have many things to say to ma belle rose blanche till then i kiss her little hands virginie de frontignac one beautiful afternoon not long after a carriage stopped at the cottage and madame de frontignac alighted mary was spinning in her garret boudoir and mrs scudder was at that moment at a little distance from the house sprinkling some linen which was laid out to bleach on the green turf of the clothes yard madame de frontignac sent away the carriage and ran up the stairway pursuing the sound of mary's spinning-wheel mingled with her song and in a moment throwing aside the curtain she seized mary in her arms and kissed her on either cheek laughing and crying both at once i knew where i should find you ma blanche i heard the wheel of my poor little princess it's a good while since we spun together mimi ah mary darling little do we know what we spend life is hard and bitter isn't it ah how white your cheeks are poor child madame de frontignac spoke with tears in her own eyes passing her hand caressingly over the fair cheeks and you've grown pale too dear madame said mary looking up and struck with the change in the once brilliant face have i petite i don't know why not we women have secret places where our life runs out at home i wear rouge that makes all right but i don't put it on for you mary you see me just as i am mary could not but notice the want of that brilliant colour and roundness in the cheek that made so glowing a picture the eyes seemed larger and tremulous with a pathetic depth and around them those bluish circles that speak of languor and pain yet still changed as she was madame de frontignac seemed only more strikingly interesting and fascinating than ever still she had those thousand pretty movements those nameless graces of manner those wavering shades of expression that irresistibly enchained the eye and the imagination true frenchwoman as she was always in one rainbow shimmer of fancy and feeling like one of those cloud-spotted april days which give you flowers and rain sun and shadow and snatches of bird singing all at once i have sent away my carriage mary and come to stay with you you want me n'est ce pas she said coaxingly with her arms round mary's neck if you don't tant pis for i am the bad penny you english speak of you cannot get me off i am sure dear friend said mary earnestly we don't want to put you off i know it you are true you mean what you say you are all good real gold down to your hearts that is why i love you but you my poor mary your cheeks are very white poor little heart you suffer no said mary i do not suffer now christ has given me the victory over sorrow there was something sadly sublime in the manner in which this was said and something so sacred in the expression of mary's face that madame de frontignac crossed herself as she had been wont before a shrine and then said sweet mary pray for me i am not at peace i cannot get the victory over sorrow what sorrow can you have said mary you so beautiful so rich so admired whom everybody must love that is what i came to tell you i came to confess to you but you must sit down there she said placing mary on a low seat in the garret window and virginie will sit here she said drawing a bundle of uncarded wool towards her and sitting down at mary's feet dear madame said mary let me get you a better seat no no mignon this is best i want to lay my head in your lap 
and she took off her riding hat with its streaming plume and tossed it carelessly from her and laid her head down on mary's lap now don't call me madam any more do you know she said raising her head with a sudden brightening of cheek and eye do you know that there are two me's to this person one is virginie and the other is madame de frontignac everybody in philadelphia knows madame de frontignac she is very gay very careless very happy she never has any serious hours or any sad thoughts she wears powder and diamonds and dances all night and never prays that is madame but virginie is quite another thing she is tired of all this tired of the balls and the dancing and the diamonds and the bow and she likes true people and would like to live very quiet with somebody that she loved she is very unhappy and she prays too sometimes in a poor little way like the birds in your nest out there who don't know much but chipper and cry because they are hungry this is your virginie madame never comes here never call me madame dear virginie said mary how i love you do you mary bien sûr you are my good angel i felt a good impulse from you when i first saw you and have always been stronger to do right when i got one of your pretty little letters oh mary darling i have been very foolish and very miserable and sometimes tempted to be very very bad oh sometimes i thought i would not care for god or anything else it was very bad of me but i was like a foolish little fly caught in a spider's net before he knows it mary's eyes questioned her companion with an expression of eager sympathy somewhat blended with curiosity end of section twenty nine section thirty of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty five part two i can't make you understand me quite said madame de frontignac unless i go back a good many years you see dear mary my dear angel mamma died when i was very little and i was sent to be educated at the sacre coeur in paris i was very happy and very good in those days the sisters loved me and i loved them and i used to be so pious and loved god dearly when i took my first communion sister agatha prepared me she was a true saint and is in heaven now and i remember when i came to her all dressed like a bride with my white crown and white veil that she looked at me so sadly and said she hoped i would never love anybody better than god and then i should be happy i didn't think much of those words then but oh i have since many times they used to tell me always that i had a husband who was away in the army and who would come to marry me when i was seventeen and that he would give me all sorts of beautiful things and show me everything i wanted to see in the world and that i must love and honour him well i was married at last and monsieur de frontignac is a good brave man although he seemed to me very old and sober but he was always kind to me and gave me nobody knows how many sets of jewellery and let me do everything i wanted to and so i liked him very much but i thought there was no danger i should love him or anybody else better than god i didn't love anybody in those days i only liked people and some people more than others all the men i saw professed to be lovers and i liked to lead them about and see what foolish things i could make them do because it pleased my vanity but i laughed at the very idea of love well mary when we came to philadelphia i heard everybody speaking of colonel burr and what a fascinating man he was and i thought it would be a pretty thing to have him in my train and so i did all i could to charm him i tried all my little arts and if it is a sin for us women to do such things i am sure i have been punished for it mary he was stronger than i was these men they are not satisfied with having the whole earth under their feet and having all the strength and all the glory but they must even take away our poor little rain it's too bad 
i can't tell you how it was i didn't know myself but it seemed to me that he took my very life away from me and it was all done before i knew it he called himself my friend my brother he offered to teach me english he read with me and by and by he controlled my whole life i that used to be so haughty so proud i that used to laugh to think how independent i was of everybody i was entirely under his control though i tried not to show it i didn't well know where i was for he talked friendship and i talked friendship he talked about sympathetic natures that are made for each other and i thought how beautiful it all was it was living in a new world m de frontignac was as much charmed with him as i was he often told me that he was his best friend that he was his hero his model man and i thought oh mary you would wonder to hear me say what i thought i thought he was a bayard a sully a montmorency everything grand and noble and good i loved him with a religion i would have died for him i sometimes thought how i might lay down my life to save his like women i read of in history i did not know myself i was astonished i could feel so and i did not dream that this could be wrong how could i when it made me feel more religious than anything in my whole life everything in the world seemed to grow sacred i thought if men could be so good and admirable life was a holy thing and not to be trifled with but our good abbe is a faithful shepherd and when i told him these things in confession he told me i was in great danger danger of falling into mortal sin oh mary it was as if the earth opened under me he told me too that this noble man this man so dear was a heretic and that if he died he would go to dreadful pains oh mary i dare not tell you half what he told me dreadful things that make me shiver when i think of them and then he said that i must offer myself a sacrifice for him that if i would put down all this love and overcome it that god would perhaps accept it as a satisfaction and bring him into the true church at last then i began to try oh mary we never know how we love till we try to unlove it seemed like taking my heart out of my breast and separating life from life how can one do it i wish any one would tell me the abbe said i must do it by prayer but it seemed to me prayer only made me think the more of him but at last i had a great shock everything broke up like a great grand noble dream and i waked out of it just as weak and wretched as one feels when one has overslept oh mary i found i was mistaken in him all all holy madame de frontignac laid her forehead on mary's knee and her long chestnut hair drooped down over her face he was going somewhere with my husband to explore out in the regions of the ohio where he had some splendid schemes of founding a state and i was all interest and one day as they were preparing m de frontignac gave me a quantity of papers to read and arrange and among them was a part of a letter i never could imagine how it got there it was to one of his confidential friends i read it at first wondering what it meant till i came to two or three sentences about me madame de frontignac paused a moment and then said rising with sudden energy mary that man never loved me he cannot love he does not know what love is what i felt he cannot know he cannot even dream of it because he never felt anything like it such men never know us women we are as high as heaven above them it is true enough that my heart was wholly in his power but why because i adored him as something divine incapable of dishonour incapable of selfishness incapable of even a thought that was not perfectly noble and heroic if he had been all that i would have been proud to have been even a poor little flower that should exhale away to give him an hour's pleasure i would have offered my whole life to god as a sacrifice for such a glorious soul and all this time what was he thinking of me he was using my feelings to carry his plans he was admiring me like a picture he was considering what he should do with me and were it not for his interests with my husband he would have tried his power to make me sacrifice this world and the next to his pleasure but he does not know me 
my mother was a montmorency and i have the blood of her house in my veins we are princesses we can give all but he must be a god that we give it for mary's enchanted eye followed the beautiful narrator as she enacted before her this poetry and tragedy of real life so much beyond what dramatic art can ever furnish her eyes grew splendid in their depths and brilliancy sometimes they were full of tears and sometimes they flashed out like lightnings her whole form seemed to be a plastic vehicle which translated every emotion of her soul and mary sat and looked at her with the intense absorption that one gives to the highest and deepest in art or nature enfin que faire she said at last suddenly stopping and drooping in every limb mary i have lived on this dream so long never thought of anything else now all is gone and what shall i do i think she added pointing to the nest in the tree mary i see my life in many things my heart was once still and quiet like the round little eggs that were in your nest now it has broken out of its shell and cries with cold and hunger i want my dream again i wish it all back or that my heart could go back into its shell if i only could drop this year out of my life and care for nothing as i used to i have tried to do that i can't i cannot get back where i was before would you do it dear virginie said mary would you if you could it was very noble and sweet all that said virginie it gave me higher thoughts than ever i had before i think my feelings were beautiful but now they are like little birds that have no mother they kill me with their crying dear virginie there is a real friend in heaven who is all you can ask or think nobler better purer who cannot change and cannot die and who loved you and gave himself for you you mean jesus said virginie ah i know it and i say the offices to him daily but my heart is very wild and starts away from my words i say my god i give myself to you and after all i don't give myself and i don't feel comforted dear mary you must have suffered too for you loved really i saw it when we feel a thing ourselves we can see very quick the same in others and it was a dreadful blow to come so all at once yes it was said mary i thought i must die but christ has given me peace these words were spoken with that long breathed sigh with which we always speak of peace a sigh that told of storms and sorrows past the sighing of the wave that falls spent and broken on the shores of eternal rest there was a little pause in the conversation and then virginie raised her head and spoke in a sprightlier tone well my little fairy cat my white doe i have come to you poor virginie want something to hold to her heart let me have you she said throwing her arms round mary dear dear virginie indeed you shall said mary i will love you dearly and pray for you i always have prayed for you ever since the first day i knew you i knew it i felt your prayers in my heart mary i have many thoughts that i dare not tell to any one lately but i cannot help feeling that some are real christians who are not in the true church you are as true a saint as saint catherine indeed i always think of you when i think of our dear lady and yet they say there is no salvation out of the church this was a new view of the subject to mary who had grown up with the familiar idea that the romish church was babylon and antichrist and who had during the conversation been revolving the same surmises with regard to her friend she turned her grave blue eyes on madame de frontignac with a somewhat surprised look which melted into a half smile but the latter still went on with a puzzled air as if trying to talk herself out of some mental perplexity now burr is a heretic and more than that he is an infidel he has no religion in his heart i saw that often it made me tremble for him it ought to have put me on my guard but you dear mary you love jesus as your life i think you love him just as much as sister agatha who was a saint 
the abbe says that there is nothing so dangerous as to begin to use our reason in religion that if we once begin we never know where it may carry us but i can't help using mine a very little i must think there are some saints that are not in the true church all are one who love christ said mary we are one in him i should not dare to tell the abbe said madame de frontignac and mary queried in her heart whether dr hopkins would feel satisfied that she could bring this wanderer to the fold of christ without undertaking to batter down the walls of her creed and yet there they were the catholic and the puritan each strong in her respective faith yet melting together in that embrace of love and sorrow joined in the great communion of suffering mary took up her testament and read the fourteenth of john let not your heart be troubled ye believe in god believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go to prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you unto myself that where i am there you may be also mary read on through the chapter through the next wonderful prayer her face grew solemnly transparent as of an angel for her soul was lifted from earth by the words and walked with christ far above all things over that starry pavement where each footstep is on a world the greatest moral effects are like those of music not wrought out by sharp-sided intellectual propositions but melted in by a divine fusion by words that have mysterious indefinite fullness of meaning made living by sweet voices which seem to be the outthrobbings of angelic hearts so one verse in the bible read by a mother in some hour of tender prayer has a significance deeper and higher than the most elaborate of sermons the most acute of arguments virginie frontignac sat as one divinely enchanted while that sweet voice read on and when the silence fell between them she gave a long sigh as we do when sweet music stops they heard between them the soft stir of summer leaves the distant songs of birds the breezy hum when some afternoon wind shivered through many branches and the silver sea chimed in virginie rose at last and kissed mary on the forehead that is a beautiful book she said and to read it all by one's self must be lovely i cannot understand why it should be dangerous it has not injured you sweet saint she added let me stay with you you shall read to me every day do you know i came here to get you to take me i want you to show me how to find peace where you do will you let me be your sister yes indeed said mary with a cheek brighter than it had been for many a day her heart feeling a throb of more real human pleasure than for long months will you get your mamma to let me stay said virginie with the bashfulness of a child haven't you a little place like yours with white curtains and sanded floor to give to poor little virginie to learn to be good in why do you really want to stay here with us said mary in this little house do i really said virginie mimicking her voice with a start of her old playfulness don't i really come now mimi coax the good mamma for me tell her i shall try to be very good i shall help you with the spinning you know i spin beautifully and i shall make butter and milk the cow and set the tables oh i will be so useful you can't spare me i should love to have you dearly said mary warmly but you would soon be dull for want of society here quelle idée ma petite drôle said the lady who with the mobility of her nation had already recovered some of the saucy mocking grace that was habitual to her as she began teasing mary with a thousand little childish motions indeed mimi you must keep me hid up here or may be the wolf will find me and eat me up who knows mary looked at her with inquiring eyes what do you mean i mean mary i mean that when he comes back to philadelphia he thinks he will find me there 
he thought i should stay while my husband was gone and when he finds i am gone he may come to newport and i never want to see him again without you you must let me stay with you have you told him said mary what you think i wrote to him mary but oh i can't trust my heart i want so much to believe him it kills me so to think evil of him that it will never do for me to see him if he looks at me with those eyes of his i am all gone i shall believe anything he tells me he will draw me to him as a great magnet draws a poor little grain of steel but now you know his unworthiness his baseness said mary i should think it would break all his power should you think so ah mary we cannot unlove in a minute love is a great while dying i do not worship him now as i did i know what he is i know he is bad and i am sorry for it i would like to cover it from all the world even from you mary since i see it makes you dislike him it hurts me to hear any one else blame him but sometimes i do so long to think i am mistaken that i know if i should see him i should catch at anything he might tell me as a drowning man at straws i should shut my eyes and think after all that it was all my fault and ask a thousand pardons for all the evil he has done no mary you must keep your blue eyes upon me or i shall be gone at this moment mrs scudder's voice was heard calling mary below go down now darling and tell mamma make a good little talk to her marin ah you are queen here all do as you say even the good priest there you have a little hand but it leads all so go petite mrs scudder was somewhat flurried and discomposed at the proposition there were the pros and the cons in her nature such as we all have in the first place madame de frontignac belonged to high society and that was pro for mrs scudder prayed daily against worldly vanities because she felt a little traitor in her heart that was ready to open its doors to them if not constantly talked down in the second place madame de frontignac was french there was a con for mrs scudder had enough of her father john bull in her heart to have a very wary lookout on anything french but then in the third place she was out of health and unhappy and there was a pro again for mrs scudder was as kind and motherly a soul as ever breathed but then she was a catholic con but the doctor and mary might convert her pro and then mary wanted her pro and she was a pretty bewitching lovable creature pro the pros had it and it was agreed that madame de frontignac should be installed as proprietress of the spare chamber and she sat down to the tea-table that evening in the great kitchen End of section 30. Section 31 of The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Deutschler. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter 26 My dearest Mary, I have lived through many wonderful scenes since I saw you last. My life has been so adventurous that I scarcely know myself when I think of it. But it is not of that I am going now to write. I have written all that to Mother, and she will show it to you. But since I parted from you, there has been another history going on within me, and that is what I wish to make you understand if I can. It seems to me that I have been a changed man from that afternoon when I came to your window where we parted. I have never forgotten how you looked then, nor what you said. Nothing in my life ever had such an effect on me. I thought that I loved you before, but I went away feeling that love was something so deep and high and sacred that I was not worthy to name it to you. I cannot think of the man in the world that is worthy of what you said or felt for me. From that hour there was a new purpose in my soul, a purpose which has led me upward ever since. I thought to myself in this way, there is some secret source from whence this inner life springs, and I knew that it was connected with the Bible which you gave me so I thought I would read it carefully and deliberately to see what I could make of it. I began with the beginning. It impressed me with a sense of something quaint and strange, something rather fragmentary, 
and yet there were spots all along that went right to the heart of a man who has to deal with life and things as I did. Now I must say that the doctor's preaching, as I told you, never impressed me much in any way. I could not make any connection between it and the men I had to manage, and the things I had to do in my daily life. But there were things in the Bible that struck me otherwise. There was one passage in particular, and that was where Jacob started off from all his friends to go off and seek his fortune in a strange country, and lay down to sleep all alone in the field with only a stone for his pillow. It seemed to me exactly the image of what every young man is like when he leaves his home and goes out to shift for himself in this hard world. I tell you, Mary, that one man alone on the great ocean of life feels himself a very weak thing. We are held up by each other more than we know, till we go off by ourselves into this great experiment. Well, there he was as lonesome as I upon the deck of my ship and so lying with this stone under his head, he saw a ladder in his sleep between him and heaven, and angels going up and down. That was a sight which came to the very point of his necessities. He saw that there was a way between him and God, and that there were those above who did care for him, and who could come to him and help him. Well, so the next morning he got up, and set up the stone to mark the place, and it says, Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Now there was something that looked to me like a tangible foundation to begin on. If I understand Dr. Hopkins, I believe he would have called that all selfishness, at first sight it does look a little so, but then I thought of it in this way. Here he was, all alone, God was entirely invisible to him, and how could he feel certain that he really existed unless he could come into some kind of connection with him? The point that he wanted to be sure of was more than merely to know that there was a God who made the world. He wanted to know whether he cared anything about men and would do anything to help them. And so, in fact, it was saying, If there is a God who interests himself at all in me, and will be my friend and protector, I will obey him so far as I can find out his will. I thought to myself, This is the great experiment, and I will try it. I made in my heart exactly the same resolution, and just quietly resolved to assume for a while, as a fact, that there was such a God, and whenever I came to a place where I could not help myself, just to ask his help honestly in so many words, and see what would come of it. Well, as I went on reading through the Old Testament, I was more and more convinced that all the men of those times had tried this experiment, and found that it would bear them. And, in fact, I did begin to find in my own experience a great many things happening so remarkably that I could not but think that somebody did attend even to my prayers. I began to feel a trembling faith that somebody was guiding me, and that the events of my life were not happening by accident, but working themselves out by his will. Well, as I went on in this way, there were other and higher thoughts kept rising in my mind. I wanted to be better than I was. I had a sense of a life much nobler and purer than anything I had ever lived that I wanted to come up to. But in the world of men, as I found it, such feelings are always laughed down as romantic and impracticable and impossible. But about this time I began to read the New Testament, and then the idea came to me that the same power that helped me in the lower sphere of life would help me carry out these higher aspirations. Perhaps the Gospels would not have interested me so much if I had begun with them first, but my Old Testament life seemed to have schooled me and brought me to a place where I wanted something higher 
and I began to notice that my prayers now were more that I might be noble and patient and self-denying and constant in my duty than for any other kind of help. And then I understood what met me in the very first of Matthew. He shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I began now to live a new life a life in which I felt myself coming into sympathy with you. For, Mary, when I began to read the Gospels, I took knowledge of you that you had been with Jesus. The crisis of my life was that dreadful night of the shipwreck. It was as dreadful as the day of judgment. No words of mine can describe to you what I felt when I knew that our rudder was gone and saw those hopeless rocks before us, what I felt for our poor men. But in the midst of it all, the words came into my mind. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the vessel, asleep on a pillow. And at once I felt he was there. And when the ship struck, I was only conscious of an intense going out of my soul to him, like Peter's when he threw himself from the ship to meet him in the waters. I will not recapitulate what I have already written, the wonderful manner in which I was saved and in which friends and help and prosperity and worldly success came to me again after life had seemed all lost. But now I am ready to return to my country, and I feel as Jacob did when he said, With my staff I passed over this Jordan, but now am I become two bands. I do not need any arguments now to convince me that the Bible is from above. There is a great deal in it that I cannot understand, a great deal that seems to me inexplicable. But all I can say is that I have tried its directions, and find that in my case they do work, that it is a book that I can live by, and that is enough for me. And now, Mary, I am coming home again quite another man from what I went out with a whole new world of thought and feeling in my heart, and a new purpose by which, please God, I mean to shape my life. All this under God I owe to you, and if you will let me devote my whole life to you, it will be a small return for what you have done for me. You know I left you wholly free. Others must have seen your loveliness and felt your worth and you may have learnt to love some better man than I. But I know not what hope tells me that this will not be, and I shall find true what the Bible says of love, that many waters cannot quench it, nor floods drown. In any case I shall be always from my very heart yours, and yours only, till death. James Marvin Mary rose after reading this letter wrapped into a divine state of exaltation. The pure joy in contemplating an infinite good to another, in which the question of self was utterly forgotten. He was then what she had always hoped and prayed he would be, and she pressed the thought triumphantly to her heart. He was that true and victorious man, that Christian able to subdue life, and to show in a perfect and healthy manly nature a reflection of the image of the superhuman excellence. Her prayers that night were aspirations and praises, and she felt how possible it might be so to appropriate the good and the joy and the nobleness of others, so as to have in them an eternal and satisfying pleasure. And with this came the dearer thought, that she, in her weakness and solitude, had been permitted to put her hand to the beginning of a work so noble. The consciousness of good, done to an immortal spirit, is wealth that neither life nor death can take away. And so, having prayed, she lay down with that sleep which God giveth to his beloved. End of chapter 26
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty seven mrs scudder kissed her daughter and left her after a moment's thought mary gathered the long silky folds of hair around her head and knotted them for the night then leaning forward on her toilet table she folded her hands together and stood regarding the reflection of herself in the mirror nothing is capable of more ghostly effect than such a silent lonely contemplation of that mysterious image of ourselves which seems to look out of an infinite depth in the mirror as if it were our own soul beckoning to us visibly from unknown regions those eyes look into our own with an expression sometimes vaguely sad and inquiring the face wears weird and tremulous lights and shadows it asks us mysterious questions and troubles us with the suggestions of our relations to some dim unknown the sad blue eyes that gazed into mary's had that look of calm initiation of melancholy comprehension peculiar to eyes made clairvoyant by great and critical sorrow they seemed to say to her fulfil thy mission life is made for sacrifice the flower must fall before fruit can perfect itself a vague shuddering of mystery gave intensity to her reverie it seemed as if those mere depths were another world she heard the far-off dashing of sea-green waves she felt a yearning impulse towards that dear soul gone out into the infinite unknown her word just passed had in her eyes all the sacred force of the most solemnly attested vow and she felt as if that vow had shut some before open door between her and him and she had a kind of shadowy sense of a throbbing and yearning nature that seemed to call on her that seemed surging towards her with an imperative protesting force that shook her heart to its depths perhaps it is so that souls once intimately related have ever after this strange power of affecting each other a power that neither absence nor death can annul how else can we interpret these mysterious hours in which the power of departed love seems to overshadow us making our souls vital with such longings with such wild throbbings with such unutterable sighings that a little more might burst the mortal band is it not deep calling unto deep the free soul singing outside the cage to her mate beating against the bars within mary even for a moment fancied that a voice called her name and started shivering then the habits of her positive and sensible education returned at once and she came out of her reverie as one breaks from a dream and lifted all these sad thoughts with one heavy sigh from her breast and opening her bible she read they that trust in the lord shall be as mount zion that cannot be moved as the mountains are round about jerusalem so the lord is about his people from this time henceforth and for evermore then she kneeled by her bedside and offered her whole life a sacrifice to the loving god who had offered his life a sacrifice for her she prayed for grace to be true to her promise to be faithful to the new relation she had accepted she prayed that all vain regrets for the past might be taken away and that her soul might vibrate without discord in unison with the will of eternal love so praying she rose calm and with that clearness of spirit which follows an act of uttermost self-sacrifice and so calmly she lay down and slept with her two hands crossed upon her breast her head slightly turned on the pillow her cheek pale as marble and her long dark lashes lying drooping with a sweet expression as if under that mystic veil of sleep the soul were seeing things forbidden to the waking eye only the gentlest heaving of the quiet breast told that the heavenly spirit within had not gone where it was hourly aspiring to go meanwhile mrs scudder had left mary's room and entered the doctor's study holding a candle in her hand the good man was sitting alone in the dark with his head bowed upon his bible when mrs scudder entered he rose and regarded her wistfully but did not speak 
he had something just then in his heart for which he had no words so he only looked as a man does who hopes and fears for the answer of a decided question mrs scudder felt some of the natural reserve which becomes a matron coming charged with a gift in which lies the whole sacredness of her own existence and which she puts from her hands with a jealous reverence she therefore measured the man with her woman's and mother's eye and said with a little stateliness my dear sir i come to tell you the result of my conversation with mary she made a little pause and the doctor stood before her as humbly as if he had not weighed and measured the universe because he knew that though he might weigh the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance yet it was a far subtler power which must possess him of one small woman's heart in fact he felt to himself like a great awkward clumsy mountainous earthite asking of a white-robed angel to help him up a ladder of cloud he was perfectly sure for the moment that he was going to be refused and he looked humbly firm he would take it like a man his large blue eyes generally so misty in their calm had a resolute clearness rather mournful than otherwise of course no such celestial experience was going to happen to him he cleared his throat and said well madam mrs scudder's womanly dignity was appeased she reached out her hand cheerfully and said she has accepted the doctor drew his hand suddenly away turned quickly round and walked to the window although as it was ten o'clock at night and quite dark there was evidently nothing to be seen there he stood there quietly swallowing very hard and raising his handkerchief several times to his eyes there was enough went on under the black coat just then to make quite a little figure in a romance if it had been uttered but he belonged to a class who lived romance but never spoke it in a few moments he returned to mrs scudder and said i trust dear madam that this very dear friend may never have reason to think me ungrateful for her wonderful goodness and whatever sins my evil heart may lead me into i hope i may never fall so low as to forget the undeserved mercy of this hour if ever i shrink from duty or murmur at trials while so sweet a friend is mine i shall be vile indeed the doctor in general viewed himself on the discouraging side and had berated and snubbed himself all his life as a, a most flagitious and evil-disposed individual a person to be narrowly watched and capable of breaking at any moment into the most flagrant iniquity and therefore it was that he received his good fortune in so different a spirit from many of the lords of creation in similar circumstances i am sensible he added that a poor minister without much power of eloquence and commissioned of the lord to speak unpopular truths and whose worldly condition in consequence is never likely to be very prosperous that such a one could scarcely be deemed a suitable partner for so very beautiful a young woman who might expect proposals in a temporal point of view of a much more advantageous nature and i am therefore the more struck and overpowered with this blessed result these last words caught in the doctor's throat as if he were overpowered in very deed in regard to her happiness said the doctor with a touch of awe in his voice i would not have presumed to become the guardian of it were it not that i am persuaded it is assured by a higher power for when he giveth peace who then can make trouble but i trust i may say no effort on my part shall be wanting to secure it mrs scudder was a mother and come to that spot in life where mothers always feel tears rising behind their smiles she pressed the doctor's hand silently and they parted for the night we know not how we can acquit ourselves to our friends of the great world for the details of such an unfashionable courtship so well as by giving them before they retire for the night a dip into a more modish view of things the doctor was evidently green green in his faith green in his simplicity green in his general belief of the divine in woman green in his particular humble faith in one small puritan maiden whom a knowing fellow might at least have manoeuvred so skilfully as to break up her saintly superiority 
discompose her rout her ideas and lead her up and down a swamp of hopes and fears and conjectures till she was wholly bewildered and ready to take him at last if he made up his mind to have her at all as a great bargain for which she was to be sensibly grateful yes the doctor was green immortally green as a cedar of lebanon which waving its broad archangel wings over some fast-rooted eternal old solitude and seeing from its sublime height the vastness of the universe veils its kingly head with humility before god's infinite majesty he is gone to bed now simple old soul first apologizing to mrs scudder for having kept her up to so dissipated and unparalleled an hour as ten o'clock on his personal matters meanwhile our asmodeus will transport us to an easily furnished apartment in one of the most fashionable hotels of philadelphia where colonel aaron burr just returned from his trip to the then aboriginal wilds of ohio is seated before a table covered with maps letters books and papers his keen eye runs over the addresses of the letters and he eagerly seizes one from madame de frontignac and reads it and as no one but ourselves is looking at him now his face has no need to wear its habitual mask first comes an expression of profound astonishment then of chagrin and mortification then of deepening concern there were stops where the dark eyelashes flashed together as if to brush a tear out of the view of the keen-sided eyes and then a red flush rose even to his forehead and his delicate lips wore a sarcastic smile he laid down the letter and made one or two turns through the room the man had felt the dashing against his own of a strong generous indignant woman's heart fully awakened and speaking with that impassioned vigour with which a french regiment charges in battle there were those picturesque winged words those condensed expression those subtle piercings of meaning and above all that simple pathos for which the french tongue has no superior and for the moment the woman had the victory she shook his heart but burr resembled the marvel with which chemists amuse themselves his heart was a vase filled with boiling passions while his will a still cold unmelted lump of ice lay at the bottom self-denial is not peculiar to christians they who go downward often put forth as much force to kill a noble nature as another does to annihilate a sinful one there was something in this letter so keen so searching so self-revealing that it brought on one of those interior crises in which a man is convulsed with the struggle of two natures the godlike and the demoniac and from which he must pass out more wholly to the dominion of the one or the other nobody knew the true better than burr he knew the godlike and the pure he had felt its beauty and its force to the very depths of his being as the demoniac knew at once the fair man of nazareth and even now he felt the voice within that said what have i to do with thee and the rending of a struggle of heavenly life with fast-coming eternal death that letter had told him what he might be and what he was it was as if his dead mother's hand had held up before him a glass in which he saw himself white robed and crowned and so dazzling in purity that he loathed his present self as he walked up and down the room perturbed he sometimes wiped tears from his eyes and then set his teeth and compressed his lips at last his face grew calm and settled in its expression his mouth wore a sardonic smile he came and took the letter and folding it leisurely laid it on the table and put a heavy paper weight over it as if to hold it down and bury it then drawing to himself some maps of new territories he set himself vigorously to some columns of arithmetical calculations on the margin and thus he worked for an hour or two till his mind was as dry and his pulse as calm as a machine then he drew the inkstand towards him and scribbled hastily the following letter to his most confidential associate a letter which told no more of the conflict that preceded it than do the dry sands and civil gossip of the sea waves to-day of the storm and wreck of last week 
dear so-and-so nous voila once more in philadelphia our schemes in ohio prosper frontenac remains there to superintend he answers our purpose passablement on the whole i don't see as we could do better than retain him he is besides a gentlemanly agreeable person and wholly devoted to me a point certainly not to be overlooked as to your railleries about the fair madame i must say in justice both to her and myself that any grace with which she has been pleased to honour me is not to be misconstrued you are not to imagine any but the most platonic of liaisons she is as high-strung as an arabian steed proud heroic romantic and french and such must be permitted to take their own time and way which we in our gaucherie can only humbly wonder at i have ever professed myself her abject slave ready to follow any whim and obeying the slightest signal of the jewelled hand as that is her sacred pleasure i have been inhabiting the most abstract realms of heroic sentiment living on the most diluted moonshine and spinning out elaborately all those charming and seraphic distinctions between tweedledum and tweedledee with which these ecstatic creatures delight themselves in certain stages of affaire du coeur the last development on the part of my goddess is a fit of celestial anger of the cause of which i am in the most innocent ignorance she writes me three pages of french sublimities writing as only a frenchwoman can bids me an eternal adieu and informs me she is going to newport of course the affair becomes stimulating i am not to presume to dispute her sentence or doubt a lady's perfect sincerity in wishing never to see me again but yet i think i shall try to pacify the tantus in animus celestibus iris if a woman hates you it is only her love turned wrong side out and you may turn it back with due care the pretty creatures know how becoming a grand passion is and take care to keep themselves in mind a quarrel serves their turn when all else fails to another point i wish you to advertise s that his insinuations in regard to me in the aurora have been observed and that i require that they be promptly retracted he knows me well enough to attend to this hint i am in earnest when i speak if the word does nothing the blow will come and if i strike once no second blow will be needed yet i do not wish to get him on my hands needlessly a duel and a love affair and hot weather coming on together might prove too much even for me n b thermometer stands at eighty five i am resolved on newport next week yours ever burr p s i forgot to say that oddly enough my goddess has gone and placed herself under the wing of the pretty puritan i saw in newport fancy the melange could anything be more piquant that cart-load of goodness the old doctor that sweet little saint and madame faubourg st germain shaken up together fancy her listening with well-bred astonishment to a critique on the doings of the unregenerate or flirting that little jewelled fan of hers in mrs scudder's square pew of a sunday probably they will carry her to the weekly prayer-meeting which of course she will find some fine french subtlety for admiring and trouve ravissant i fancy i see it when burr had finished this letter he had actually written himself into a sort of persuasion of its truth when a finely constituted nature wishes to go into baseness it has first to bribe itself evil is never embraced undisguised as evil but under some fiction which the mind accepts and with which it has the singular power of blinding itself in the face of daylight the power of imposing on one's self is an essential preliminary to imposing on others the man first argues himself down and then he is ready to put the whole weight of his nature to deceiving others this letter ran so smoothly so plausibly that it produced on the writer of it the effect of a work of fiction which we know to be unreal but feel to be true long habits of this kind of self-delusion in time produce a paralysis in the vital nerves of truth so that one becomes habitually unable to see things in their verity 
and realizes the awful words of scripture he feedeth on ashes a deceived heart hath turned him aside so that he cannot deliver his soul nor say is there not a lie in my right hand end of section thirty two section thirty three of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty eight between three and four the next morning the robin in the nest above mary's room stretched out his left wing opened one eye and gave a short and rather drowsy chirp which broke up his night's rest and restored him to the full consciousness that he was a bird with wings and feathers a large apple-tree to live in and all heaven for an estate and so on these fortunate premises he broke into a gush of singing clear and loud which mary without waking heard in her slumbers scarcely conscious she lay in that dim clairvoyant state when the half-sleep of the outward senses permits a delicious dewy clearness of the soul that perfect ethereal rest and freshness of faculties comparable only to what we imagine of the spiritual state season of celestial enchantment in which the heavy weight of all this unintelligible world drops off and the soul divinely charmed nestles like a wind-tossed bird in the protecting bosom of the one all-perfect all-beautiful what visions then come to the inner eye have often no words corresponding in mortal vocabularies the poet the artist and the prophet in such hours become possessed of divine certainties which all their lives they struggle with pencil or song or burning words to make evident to their fellows the world around wonders but they are unsatisfied because they have seen the glory and know how inadequate the copy but not merely to selectest spirits come these hours but to those humble poets ungifted with utterance who are among men as fountains sealed whose song can be wrought out only by the harmony of deeds the patient pathetic melodies of tender endurance or the heroic chant of undiscouraged labour the poor slave-woman last night parted from her only boy and weary with the cotton-picking the captive pining in his cell the patient wife of the drunkard saddened by a consciousness of the growing vileness of one once so dear the delicate spirit doomed to harsh and uncongenial surroundings all in such hours feel the soothings of a celestial harmony the tenderness of more than a mother's love it is by such hours as these often more than by reasonings or disputings that doubts are resolved in the region of religious faith the all-father treats us as the mother does her infant crying in the dark he does not reason with our fears or demonstrate their fallacy but draws us silently to his bosom and we are at peace nay there have been those undoubtedly who have known god falsely with the intellect yet felt him truly with the heart and there may be many principally among the unlettered little ones of christ's flock who positively know that much that is dogmatically propounded to them of their redeemer is cold barren unsatisfying and even utterly false who yet can give no account of their certainties better than that of the inspired fisherman we know him and have seen him it was in such hours as these that mary's deadly fears for the soul of her beloved had passed away passed out of her as if some warm healing nature of tenderest vitality had drawn out of her heart all pain and coldness and warmed it with the breath of an eternal summer so while the purple shadows spread their gauzy veils inwove with fire along the sky and the gloom of the sea broke out here and there into lines of light and thousands of birds were answering to each other from apple tree and meadow grass and top of jagged rock or trooping in bands hither and thither like angels on loving messages mary lay there with the flickering light through the leaves fluttering over her face and the glow of dawn warming the snow-white draperies of the bed and giving a tender rose hue to the calm cheek she lay half conscious smiling the while as one who sleeps while the heart waketh and who hears in dreams the voice of the one eternally beautiful and beloved mrs scudder entered her room and thinking that she still slept stood and looked down upon her 
she felt as one does who has parted with some precious possession a sudden sense of its value coming over her and she queried in herself whether any living mortal were worthy of so perfect a gift and nothing but a remembrance of the doctor's prostrate humility at all reconciled her to the sacrifice she was making mary dear she said bending over her with an unusual infusion of emotion in her voice darling child the arms moved instinctively even before the eyes unclosed and drew her mother down to her with a warm clinging embrace love in puritan families was often like latent caloric an all-pervading force that affected no visible thermometer shown chiefly by a noble silent confidence a ready helpfulness but seldom outbreathed in caresses yet natures like mary's always craved these outward demonstrations and sprang towards them as a trailing vine sways to the nearest support it was delightful for once fully to feel how much her mother loved her as well as to know it dear precious mother do you love me so very much i live and breathe in you mary said mrs scudder giving vent to herself in one of those trenchant shorthand expressions wherein positive natures incline to resume all when they must speak at all mary held her mother silently to her breast her heart shining through her face with a quiet radiance of love do you feel happy this morning said mrs scudder very 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 happy mother i am so glad to hear you say so said mrs scudder who to say the truth had entertained many doubts at her pillow the night before mary began dressing herself in a state of calm exaltation every trembling leaf on the tree every sunbeam was like a loving smile of god every fluttering breeze like his voice full of encouragement and hope mother did you tell the doctor what i said last night i did my darling then mother i would like to see him a few moments alone well mary he is in his study at his morning devotions that is just the time i will go to him the doctor was sitting by the window and the honest-hearted motherly lilacs a bloom for the third time since our story began were filling the air with their sweetness suddenly the door opened and mary entered in her simple white short gown and skirt her eyes calmly radiant and her whole manner having something serious and celestial she came directly towards him and put out both her little hands with a smile half childlike half angelic and the doctor bowed his head and covered his face with his hands dear friend said mary kneeling and taking his hands if you want me i am come life is but a moment there is an eternal blessedness just beyond us and for the little time between i will be all i can to you if you will only show me how and the doctor no young man the study door closed just then and no one heard those words from a quaint old oriental book which told that all the poetry of that grand old soul had burst into flower as the aloe blossoms once in a hundred years the ripples of that great heart might have fallen unconsciously into phrases from that one love poem of the bible which these men read so purely and devoutly and which warmed the icy clearness of their intellect with the myrrh and spices of ardent lands where earthly and heavenly love meet and blend in one indistinguishable horizon line like sea and sky who is she that looketh forth as the morning fair as the moon clear as the sun my dove my undefiled is but one she is the only one of her mother thou art all fair my beloved there is no spot in thee the doctor might have said all this we will not say he did nor will we say he did not all we know is that when the breakfast-table was ready they came out cheerfully together madame de frontignac stood in a fresh white wrapper with a few buttercups in her hair waiting for the breakfast she was startled to see the doctor entering all radiant leading in mary by the hand and looking as if he thought she were some dream miracle which might dissolve under his eyes unless he kept fast hold of her the keen eyes shot their arrowy glance which went at once to the heart of the matter 
madame de frontignac knew they were engaged and regarded mary with attention the calm sweet elevated expression of her face struck her it struck her also that that was not the light of any earthly love that it had no thrill no blush no tremor but only the calmness of a soul that knows itself no more and she sighed involuntarily she looked at the doctor and seemed to study attentively a face which happiness had made this morning as genial and attractive as it was generally strong and fine there was little said at the breakfast-table this morning and yet the loud singing of the birds the brightness of the sunshine the life and vigour of all things seemed to make up for the silence of those who were too well pleased to speak eh bien ma chère said madame after breakfast drawing mary into her little room c'est fini yes said mary cheerfully thou art content said madame passing her arm around her well then i should be but mary it is like a marriage with the altar like taking the veil is it not no said mary it is not taking the veil it is beginning a cheerful reasonable life with a kind noble friend who will always love me truly and whom i hope to make as happy as he deserves i think well of him my little cat said madame reflectively but she stopped something she was going to say and kissed mary's forehead after a moment's pause she added one must have love or refuge mary this is thy refuge child thou wilt have peace in it she sighed again enfin she said resuming her gay tone what shall be la toilette de noce thou shalt have virginie's pearls my fair one and look like a sea-born venus tiens let me try them in thy hair and in a few moments she had mary's long hair down and was chattering like a blackbird wreathing the pearls in and out and saying a thousand pretty nothings weaving grace and poetry into the straight thread of puritan life end of section thirty three section thirty four of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter twenty nine the quilting the announcement of the definite engagement of two such bright particular stars in the hemisphere of the doctor's small parish excited the interest that such events usually create among the faithful of the flock there was a general rustle and flutter as when a covey of wild pigeons has been started and all the little elves who rejoice in the name of says he and says i and do tell and have you heard were speedily flying through the consecrated air of the parish the fact was discussed by matrons and maidens at the spinning-wheel and in the green clothes-yard or at the foaming wash-tub out of which arose a new birth of weekly freshness and beauty many a rustic venus of the foam as she splashed her dimpled elbows in the rainbow-tinted froth talked what should be done for the forthcoming solemnities and wondered what mary would have on when she was married and whether she the venus should get an invitation to the wedding and whether ethan would go not that she cared in the least whether he did or not grave elderly matrons talked about the prosperity of zion which they imagined intimately connected with the event of their minister's marriage and descending from zion speculated on bed quilts and tablecloths and rummaged their own clean sweet-smelling stores fragrant with balm and rose leaves to lay out a bureau cover or a pair of sheets or a dozen napkins for the wedding outfit the solemnest of solemn quiltings was resolved upon miss prissy declared that she fairly couldn't sleep nights with the responsibility of the wedding dresses in her mind but yet she must give one day to getting on that quilt the grand monde also was in motion mrs general wilcox called in her own particular carriage bearing the present of a cashmere shawl for the bride with the general's best compliments and also an oak-leaf pattern for quilting which had been sent her from england and which was authentically established to be that used 
on a petticoat belonging to the princess royal and mrs major seaforth came also bearing a scarf of worked indian muslin and mrs vernon sent a splendid indian china punch-bowl indeed to say the truth the notables high and mighty of newport whom the doctor had so unceremoniously accused of building their houses with blood and establishing their city with iniquity considering that nobody seemed to take his words to heart and that they were making money as fast as old tyre rather assumed the magnanimous and patted themselves on the shoulder for this opportunity to show the doctor that after all they were good fellows and bore him no malice though they did make money at the expense of thirty per cent human life simeon brown was the only exception he stood aloof grim and sarcastic and informed some good middle-aged ladies who came to see if he would as they phrased it esteem it a privilege to add his might to the doctor's outfit that he would give him a likely negro boy if he wanted and if he was too conscientious to keep him he might sell him at a fair profit a happy stroke of humour which he was fond of relating many years after the quilting was in these days considered as the most solemn and important recognition of a betrothal and for the benefit of those not to the manner born a little preliminary instruction may be necessary the good wives of new england impressed with that thrifty orthodoxy of economy which forbids to waste the merest trifle had a habit of saving every scrap and fragment clipped out in the fashioning of household garments and these they cut into fanciful patterns and constructed of them rainbow shapes and quaint traceries the arrangement of which became one of their few fine arts many a maiden as she sorted and arranged fluttering bits of green yellow red and blue felt rising in her breast a passion for somewhat vague and unknown which came out at length in a new pattern of patchwork and collections of these tiny fragments were always ready to fill an hour when there was nothing else to do and as the maiden chatted with her bow her busy flying needle stitched together the pretty morsels which little in themselves were destined by gradual unions and accretions to bring about at last substantial beauty warmth and comfort emblems thus of that household life which is to be brought to stability and beauty by reverent economy in husbanding and tact in arranging the little useful and agreeable morsels of daily existence when a wedding was forthcoming then there was a solemn review of the stores of beauty and utility thus provided and the patchwork spread best worthy of such distinction was chosen for the quilting there too duly summoned trooped all intimate female friends of the bride and the quilt being spread on a frame and wadded with cotton each vied with the other in the delicacy of the quilting they could put upon it for quilting also was a fine art and had its delicacies and nice points concerning which grave elderly matrons discussed with judicious care the quilting generally began at an early hour in the afternoon and ended at dusk with a great supper and general jubilee in which that ignorant and incapable sex who could not quilt were allowed to appear and put in claims for consideration of another nature it may perhaps be surmised that this expected reinforcement was often alluded to by the younger maidens whose wickedly coquettish toilettes exhibited suspicious marks of that willingness to get a chance to say no which has been slanderously attributed to mischievous maidens in consequence of the tremendous responsibilities involved in this quilting the reader will not be surprised to learn that the evening before miss prissy made her appearance at the brown cottage armed with thimble scissors and pincushion in order to relieve her mind by a little preliminary confabulation you see me miss scudder run almost to death she said but i thought i would just run up to mrs major seaforce and see her best 
bedroom quilt cause i wanted to have all the ideas we possibly could before i decided on the pattern hers is in shells just common shells nothing to be compared with miss wilcox's oak leaves and i suppose there isn't the least doubt that miss wilcox's sister in london did get that from a lady who had a cousin who was governess in the royal family and i just quilted a little bit to-day on an old piece of silk and it comes out beautiful and so i thought i would just come and ask you if you did not think it was best for us to have the oak leaves well certainly miss prissy if you think so said mrs scudder who was as pliant to the opinions of this wise woman of the parish as new england matrons generally are to a reigning dressmaker and factotum miss prissy had the happy consciousness always that her early advent under any roof was considered a matter of special grace and therefore it was with rather a patronizing tone that she announced that she would stay and spend the night with them i knew she added that your spare chamber was full with that madame de what you call her if i was to die i could not remember the woman's name well i thought i could just crawl in with you mary most anywhere that's right miss prissy said mary you shall be welcome to half my bed any time well i knew you would say so mary i never saw the thing you would not give away half of since you was that high said miss prissy illustrating her words by placing her hand about two feet from the floor just at this moment madame de frontignac entered and asked mary to come into her room and give her advice as to a piece of embroidery when she was gone out miss prissy looked after her and sank her voice once more to the confidential whisper which we before described i have heard strange stories about that french woman she said but as she was here with you and mary i suppose there cannot be any truth in them dear me the world is so censorious about women but then you know we don't expect much from french women i suppose she is a roman catholic and worships pictures and stone images but then after all she has got an immortal soul and i can't help hoping mary's influence may be blessed to her they say when she speaks french she swears every few minutes but if that is the way she was brought up maybe she isn't accountable i think we can't be too charitable for people that ain't privileged as we are miss vernon's polly told me she has seen her so sabbath day she came into her room of a sudden and she was working on her embroidery there and she never winked nor blushed nor offered to put it away but sat there just as easy polly said she never was so beat in all her life she felt kind of scared every time she thought of it but now she has come here who knows but she may be converted mary has not said much about her state of mind said mrs scudder but something of deep interest has passed between them mary is such an uncommon child that i trust everything to her we will not dwell further on the particulars of this evening nor describe how madame de frontignac reconnoitred miss prissy with keen amused eyes nor how miss prissy apprised mary in the confidential solitude of her chamber that her fingers just itched to get hold of that trimming on that madame de frog's neck's dress because she was pretty nigh sure she could make some just like it for she never saw any trimming she could not make the robin that lived in the apple tree was fairly out generaled the next morning for miss prissy was up before him tripping about the chamber on the points of her toes and knocking down all the movable things in the room in her efforts to be still so as not to wake and marry and it was not until she had finally upset the stand by the bed with the candlestick snuffers and bible on it that mary opened her eyes miss prissy dear me what is it you are doing why i'm trying to be still mary so as not to wake you up and it seems to me as if everything was possessed to tumble down so but it is only half past three so you turn over and go to sleep but miss prissy said mary sitting up in bed you are all dressed where are you going well to tell the truth mary i am just one of those people that can't sleep when they have got responsibility on their minds and i've been lying awake more than an hour here thinking about that quilt 
there is a new way of getting it on to the frame that i want to try cause you know when we quilted serinthy stebbins it would trouble us in the rolling and i have got a new way that i want to try and i mean just to get it into the frame before breakfast i was in hopes i should get out without waking any of you and now i don't know as i shall get by your mother's door without waking her cause i know she works hard and needs her rest but that bedroom door squawks like a cat enough to raise the dead mary she added with sudden energy if i had the least drop of oil in a teacup and a bit of quill i'd stop that door making such a noise and miss prissy's eyes glowed with resolution i don't know where you could find any at this time said mary well never mind i'll just go and open the door slow and careful as i can said miss prissy as she trotted out of the apartment the result of her carefulness was very soon announced to mary by a protracted sound resembling the mewing of a hoarse cat accompanied with sundry audible grunts from miss prissy terminating in a grand finale of clatter occasioned by her knocking down all the pieces of the quilt frame that stood in a corner of the room with a concussion that roused everybody in the house what is that called out mrs scudder from her bedroom she was answered by two streams of laughter one from mary sitting up in bed and the other from miss prissy holding her sides as she sat dissolved in merriment on the sanded floor End of section thirty four